This podcast episode has us introducing you to our BCEN and friend, Susan Brady. Michael Dexter and Mark Eggers talk with Susan Brady about inclusive leadership. What is inclusive leadership? Why is it so important in healthcare? Susan will discuss these questions and much more in this episode called Better Understanding. Hello, and welcome to the BCN and Friends podcast, where we hold interesting conversations about learning with a range of thought leaders, BCN certification holders, and industry professionals. But most importantly, create value and insight for you, our professional nurses across the emergency spectrum. We hope you find our discussions interesting, informative, sometimes funny, sometimes serious, but always valuable. I'm Mark Eggers, Education and Technology Services Manager. I'm joined today with my co-host, Michael Dexter, Director of Professional Development at BCN. Hi, Michael. Hey, Mark. Good to be with you today. Thanks. In this episode of BCN Friends, we have Susan Brady. Michael, could you please tell us about our BCN and friend, Susan? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Susan McKenty Brady inspires, educates, and ignites leaders globally on fostering a mindset of inclusion and self-awareness. As an expert in inclusion and the advancement of women leaders, Susan advises executives on how to create gender parity in organizations and motivates women at all levels of organizational leadership to fully realize and manifest their leadership potential. Featured on ABC's Good Morning America, Susan is the author of Mastering Your Inner Critic and Seven Other High Hurdles to Advancement, How the Best Women Leaders Practice Self-Awareness to Change What Really Matters and the 30-second guide to coaching your inner critic. A celebrated speaker, Susan has keynoted or consulted at over 500 organizations around the world. Building on the institution's 40-year history, impacting over 100,000 professional women at their events and programs, Susan now serves as the Deloitte Ellen Gabriel Chair for Women in Leadership at Simmons University and the first Chief Executive Officer of the Simmons University Institute for Inclusive Leadership. The Institute produces a global set of game-changing professional initiatives for the purpose of intersecting leadership, equity, and inclusion. Prior to joining Simmons, Susan was Executive Vice President at Linkage, a global leadership development consulting and training firm. She founded Linkage's Women in Leadership Institute and launched Linkage's global practice on advancing women leaders and inclusive leadership and led the field research behind the seven leadership hurdles women leaders face in the workforce. Dedicated to inclusively and collaboratively inspiring every girl to realize her full potential, Susan serves on the board of the not-for-profit Strong Women, Strong Girls. Susan resides in the Boston area with her husband, two teenage daughters, and two Portuguese water dogs. So Susan, welcome to BCN and Friends podcast. We're very excited to have you with us today. And we look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Can you tell us just a little bit more about yourself and how you came to lead the Simmons University Institute for Inclusive Leadership? Gosh, well, uh, you know, for several years, I traveled around and uh, speaking mainly with large groups of women in, in the workplace, but also I would say a few brave men would join about mastering their inner critic. I had just published uh, my second book on the topic. Um, that was the Mastering Your Inner Critic and Seven Hurdles to Advancement. And I knew I was ready for some professional disruption. I wasn't sure what, uh, but in the, in the women's leadership space, uh, but also the male allyship realm, Simmons University in Boston is, is sort of a crown jewel. You know, it was the first, um, Simmons produced the first business conference for women on leadership 43 years ago. Uh, Simmons offered the marketplace, the first all women's MBA, um, and uh, has now disbanded it because, you know, women are actually uh, wanted at MBA programs uh, and are applying and going. Uh, You know, Simmons has a seminal book for women at work called The Managerial Woman, which was published uh, almost five decades ago. So when the president of Simmons at the time, Helen Dryden, called me to have lunch, I knew it could get excited, exciting. And uh, she wanted to launch a new entity that, that, that took the reverence and, and the past accomplishments of Simmons and you know, bring fresh light and, and renewed impact. And I thought, yes, yes, yes. So um, you know, it's been uh, my honor to stand up this institute uh, on uh, inclusive leadership. And 
and a privilege. Uh, you know, the, the dilemma that I have been navigating both personally and professionally and then offering my learning about uh, is about feeling enough and honoring and respecting others as well because uh, they are enough and, and I was ready for the next step. So uh, I'd say, if you want to know about me, I, I think I, I, I feel called to sort of eradicate harshness in the world uh, and, you know, one conversation at a time or one podcast at a time. And I grapple uh, most days with the dilemma of, you know, what would happen if we stopped believing that our differences make us superior or inferior to one another? What would the world be like? So a lot of my, uh, a lot of my aim and, and, uh, and, and activity in the world is about that and, and also raising teenage girls and uh, disciplining dogs and having fun uh, doing other things. So. That's a little bit about me. Wow, awesome. That's neat. So you you had mentioned earlier that you talk about mastering your inner critic, but you also, of course, um, are about inclusive leadership. So can you tell us a little bit more about what inclusive leadership is, the characteristics of that, but then um, if you could also combine that with why it's so important to be able to master your inner critic uh, to be able to be a good a good leader. Or, or have good inclusive leadership? Oh yeah, I, I love the question. I love the blend of the two. So, you know, look, leading inclusively means that every human can be their unique self, have a voice, belong and make a contribution. We want people at work to, uh, you know, bring their full selves and be able to give all they got. And uh, we want that for ourselves. Um, so inclusive leaders provide ways that allow everyone across multiple types of differences to participate and contribute and feel that they're connected and they belong. So this happens without you know, losing individual uniqueness or having to give up valuable identities or aspects of themselves. Uh, so it really, you know, being an inclusive leader means paying attention to the individual needs of all of your stakeholders and then providing them you know, the, the, the tools they need to arrive and thrive to um, be intentional about understanding and learning. And uh, I'd say that the intersection with the inner critic is it is really hard to, you know, honor the contributions of others when you're critical of those people uh, or to really bring your full self and your full value when you're critical of yourself. And so I actually think mastering your inner critic and, and coaching it is a prerequisite to leading inclusively and enjoying the fruits of inclusive cultures be, because it, it, it really is an inside out kind of job, this, this job of, of thinking and being in the world in an inclusive way. Wow, that's neat. Well, you mentioned that it was a pre prerequisite to um, building that inclusive leadership ability. What would you say some of those other tools are to be able to build your inclusive leadership ability? Yeah, I mean, I think inclusive leadership has to start with the inner work on your identity and understanding who you are as a leader uh, or the what, what we call the, the no way. This is, uh, you know, it's a lifelong, uh, life-wide learning journey. And there's, there's lots of, I think, competencies and skills and activities people can do. But, you know, at Simmons, we have boiled, you know, down the job of the inclusive leader and the work to be done into three levels and six actions. So, you know, level one is becoming aware and the actions to becoming aware are really understanding by, but, you know, first you have to understand who you are in the world. What, are, what is your identity? Uh, and and how, is that, how is that the same or different? Than, um, than others and be conscious of that, right? Then we come into becoming aware, which is I now understand biases. So how do I, what are the deeply held beliefs, unconscious or conscious that I've learned about different, different identities and, different, and differences uh, and about myself. And then uh, we have to go into the work of valuing equity. You know, wait, so the world is it actually carved out so that everybody gets the same shot and that everybody is treated the same. Uh, you know, in fact, of course it's not. And it's just based on identity. It's putting work, uh, work and effort and education aside. So it's an understanding of equity. So that's that's level one: becoming aware, understanding bias, valuing equity. Level two is around becoming an ally and an upstander. So how can I partner for success? How can I actively support and advocate 
for underrepresented populations? Um, and then how can I advocate for belonging? You know, I, I'd love to talk to you more about what it means to belong. And then our third level is really becoming a change agent. So in a, in a healthcare system or on the front lines, this looks like sponsorship, right? So we're gonna actively look to ensure that our leadership is comprised of the very people, the very identities that we serve um, and that we employ. Uh, and you know that's where we make change. And so it's the trajectory I speak of about becoming aware, becoming an ally and an upstander and becoming a change agent that we teach people uh, here at Simmons, uh, leaders in organizations. And I think there's a lot of confusion about you know what it is that people have to do, but it starts, it starts in your mind, what we think and feel drives what we say and do. So it starts, it starts with an awareness. Yeah. Oh, that's really, that's great. So when, when people are becoming aware, or maybe they're in that second stage of becoming an ally or a change agent, where do you find some of their biggest hurdles are, or some of the blind spots that, that they often will miss when they're trying to move through these, these different phases that you're speaking of? Yeah, and I'll also go back to sort of why why inclusivity is so important. But you know, first for your question about blind spots, it's it's uh, everyone has them, you know, and and uh, we you know everyone thinks that you know other people have uh, bigger blind spots than than they do, you know. Uh, so so I think I recently heard my uh, a mentor and, and old uh, colleague and friend uh, Stu Kleiman uh, say in a, a webinar that we hosted at Simmons. He was talking about blind spots without using the word blind spots. And here's the frame he used, and I just loved it. So I'm going to pass it on for, for, for you. And that is, you know, think of all the stories you've heard, the books you've read, the songs you've listened to in your lifetime, the religions you've been exposed to or raised with, the beliefs in your family, the places you've traveled. Now think of all of the stories you haven't heard, all the books you haven't read, all the songs you don't listen to, all the religions you really don't know a lot about, the beliefs that are completely different that you've really never thought about, the, the places that you haven't been, the cultures you haven't been exposed to. The blind spots the, the trick with blind spots is being aware of all that we haven't been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And what you could call it humility, you could call it walking um, humbly, but it's, it's actually looking for and being aware that there's just so much by just a nature of what it means to wake up and be human that we don't know. So everyone, everyone's blind spots are different. Um, Blind spots are really about how your perception of what you're saying or doing differs from someone else's lens or perception. So we need to broaden on every level our thinking um, about how we're really open when we might not really be open because we just don't know. Yeah. That's how we address blind spots. Yeah, well, when you put it in that context, it's almost a little bit overwhelming to think of how many different religions there are, how many different cultures there are, or there's so many things. So uh, what do you encourage people to focus on? Is it is it more focusing on the individuals that they're they're relating with most closely? Or how do you how do you find any kind of I mean, it's so so open that sometimes it might seem a little overwhelming. So do you have any suggestions there? Well, I mean, I, I think I think I love the concept of wonder, you know, of uh, of, 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 of curiosity, of being aware of your own not knowing, not to the point where you feel less than or insecure, but conscious of the fact that you don't, you can't possibly see it all. The metaphor I like the most is about a prism. So if you and I were uh, across a real table and in a room with natural light, and there was a prism or crystal of some sort hanging down from the middle of the room right now, Michael, uh, you from your angle might see a cast of yellow or orange when I might see a cast of a color that's maybe green or, 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 or purple or a different color. And we could debate um, for the next half hour, who's seeing the right color light, right? And until we get up and actually see each other's view of how the light is cast in the room, will we see the light that each other sees? So that's the job of, um, I think, uh, of, of tackling the showing up more inclusively is assuming there's a different sh shade of light that another person sees and that from where you stand, you can't possibly see it. And so to move so that you can see it means with 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 humility, with grace, with curiosity, uh, 
you know, under seeking to understand, which, which actually that story and this belief that I'm sharing with you uh, is the, it was the impetus for naming my podcast at Simmons, the Better Understanding Podcasts. Yeah, I actually, yeah. that's yeah. neat. I want to ask you a little bit more about the podcast soon, but you had mentioned just a minute ago about why inclusivity is so important. And um, so I did want to make sure that we we talked about that as well as, uh, especially in our industry, which is the healthcare industry, is, is why do you feel inclusivity is so important uh, in, in this day and age? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if we think about inclusion as I feel like I can bring my unique skill set and I belong and that therefore I am celebrated for what I bring so I feel safe to speak up and I feel like I'm part of something, I am by definition going to take more risks because there's psychological safety to do so. So at the core, particularly in a healthcare environment, particularly an emergency healthcare environment, to not say what you see, even if you're wrong, is more dangerous than saying what you see. Saying, sorry, not saying what you see, right? So we want to foster a environment where it is safe to speak up. Um, but organizations with inclusive cultures are more likely to meet and exceed financial targets. They're more likely to be high performing. They're more likely to innovate and be agile. You know, Deloitte just did um, a nice uh, report on, you know, that found that organizations with inclusive cultures are eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. Look, that's true for healthcare systems and for uh, you know, hospitals as well, right? Uh, so, so we know that where people can come in and bring their gifts and talents and it's safe to speak up and they feel like they belong, we just get better outcomes. So it's, it's really important actually in organizational life that we learn how to do this well. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, having worked in the ED for quite some time now, I've seen that very thing happen before. It, sometimes it's just being new in the environment and not understanding it, but other times it is. It's like people feel like if they speak up, then there could be a negative consequence. And I definitely uh, see how that, that entire culture needs to change and we need to be more accepting of those. Thank you for sharing. I wanted to turn it over to Mark, but before we do... I do want to hear about your podcast as well. So we can talk about it now or we can talk about it towards the end, but I would love to hear more about your podcast. Well, I'm happy to just give you a, a little bit of a, an idea. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you can find it at inclusiveleadership.com, which, uh, and, and under, uh, or just Google better understanding podcast. It's available on uh, Apple podcast and Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, you know, maybe, many of the major distributions. But look, this is about uh, better understanding why inclusive leadership matters. What is inclusion? I want to just, I want to take all the mystery out of this thing, right? In some ways, I feel like just good leadership is inclusive leadership. So maybe it's an oxymoron, but uh, the Better Understanding podcast I, I created with my colleagues and I host because I, I, I feel, particularly after the um, you know, with the political climate, what it is in the United States or what and what it has been in recent years and with uh, certainly with with the pandemic, there, there are so many uh, opposite opinions that have been formed about every topic you can think of. And I've seen the desire to better understand decrease and the desire to tell how it is increase. And I really value curiosity. And so my, my, my goal with the Better Understanding podcast is to sort of offer an extended hand to anyone who just wants to learn more about what this means. And so my guests are just, you know, brilliant practitioners and leaders who have been navigating the world of diversity and inclusion for a very long time and help us sort of iron out what we're talking about. So I hope people join us. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to have to listen to that. Got a question for you here. Tell us about an event or person in your career that made a significant impact on you. Oh, gosh. I, uh, that's so funny. I, I, I was reflecting uh, on, on this recently, and there are, there are so, so many. Uh, you know, as of late, I would say I'm, I'm in the business of learning. And 
I'm a teacher and in every podcast, I learn something from, you know, the, the guests of the podcast in every conversation, I find myself thinking, oh my gosh, that's so, that's so helpful. Or I just want to, I try it on. So uh, there are several, you know, it's so funny. I wonder how your other guests answer this question. One does have to think deeply about the trajectory of their life, but I go back to um, my dad. So I was raised by a single father, um, very rare in the 70s. My parents were divorced amicably and I saw my mother a good bit, but I uh, was raised by my single father. And I remember him telling me when I was, I don't know, young, like six, seven, you know, your, your place isn't in the kitchen unless you want it to be. And I remember thinking to myself, why on earth would my place be in the kitchen? Um, so, you know, he laid, he was sort of, you know, he came before his, his narrative came before my awareness that the world might treat me differently because I woke up woman. And of course I didn't understand this at all until I understood it until I saw that my male counterparts could say or do things and I could say or do the exact same thing and it would land differently. Uh, and, uh, I would say my father was ahead of his time and the way he impacted me was he, uh, he expected that I embrace the world fully and offer my gifts and talents and encourage me to boldly go do it. So to him, he's, he's, he passed 13 years ago and he's, it, this is actually, we're close to um, the anniversary of his death. So it feels like a great tribute just to, just to honor his legacy and say how, uh, how fortunate I feel to have been raised by him. And I'm sure be very proud of you. Yes, he. I think he would. He would. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So I'm gonna turn a little bit here. We're gonna do what's called rapid fire questions. So, what would you be doing if you were not in your current role? Is there anything before you went into what you're in now? You know, what else would you be doing? Uh, you know. I don't know. I got, I was doing a lot of keynote speaking and I love that. I like the ed edutainment of it. You know, I, I have a background in theater and so it just appealed to my, the perf my performance sensibilities, but you know, if I'm daydreaming, I, Mark, I'd say like, you know, be a travel blogger, a critic, you know, a spot critic, maybe a stand up comic, maybe a novelist or some combination of all those things. I think, you know, I have, I have an abiding love and a deep disdain for all things critic. And so it, 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 it would just be fun <laughs> to be one <laughs> after all the work I've done. So that'd be good. Yeah. I like that. Excellent. So now I'm going to give you three categories regarding your favorites. Okay. And if you want to skip one, you can. I'll ask it again if you do skip. No, if you want to skip, you can. That's fine. So uh, here we go. Your favorite book, other uh, than your other than your own books. Okay, I can't. I can't name one of my. I wouldn't name one of my own books. Um, let's see. My favorite book. Uh, you know, I go back to the Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. He's just. Here's why. You know, for, for you know, to put forward for a happy life that physical well-being is important, but that true wellness must include a happy mind. Uh, I, I guess I could argue he's just one of the greatest teachers of my life. And the happy mind concept, I think, takes a lot of mental energy and I'm trying to help. So I'd say that's the first book that comes to mind that I love. Good, good. How about your favorite movie? Oh, wow. I mean, it's a toss-up. It's so funny how, how, how a favorite movie, the things that stick in my mind are older movies, but I don't know. I, I probably, if I were pressed to answer, it would be a movie called Love Actually. I, I think it's like 20 years old now, but uh, that's probably, it just has the whole thing. I'm a rom-com lover. I, I, you know, I, I like to laugh and I like to, I like a little romance, you know, it's, um, that's how I, you know, unplug. No, I'm with you. Some of those old movies are, cla they're great. You, yeah. you know, you even laugh, some of the ones for the black and white ones from, 50s and six, or some of those are great too so, yeah. Yeah. no good and then your favorite song my favorite song uh so i definitely have anthems for moments in my life where my children tease me they're like oh my god you listen to that all the time my 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 alarm on my phone which wakes me up now is actually set right now to uh a bob marley favorite three little birds you know I, and, and hearing every every morning you know 
don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right is about the right message I need to hear. So um, that's, I'd say, my, 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 favorite, my favorite song today is a, a Bob Marley song. Good. And that's true today because it does change. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's good. And how about, you know, do you have any other hobbies or interests? Things that we don't know about. Oh, I love that. It's so funny. I, um, I love to ask guests on my podcast, what, what can I learn about you that I wouldn't find out on LinkedIn? And it's so, it's so fun what people share. Look, I, you know, I, I love traveling and, uh, you know, I, I like reading and I do a lot of time walking and hiking and hanging out with my dogs. But I'd say my number one hobby or interest feels like it doesn't get any credit for being a hobby or interest. I feel like, you know, I'm supposed to say like pottery or golf or dancing, but I'd say my number one hobby and interest is storytelling. And that's, I'm pretty, you know, that's a democratized version of storytelling. I like to hear stories. I like to tell stories. I like to seek to understand myself and others through stories. I like to watch stories. I listen for stories and in, in music, you know, so I'd say that's my, my hobby that and, and having, connection with with people um i'm a social junkie at heart you know i love connecting with people that's great great and talking about social you know our audience would like to follow you online there's your website and uh, www.inclusiveleadership.com and where they can find out more information about Bender understanding podcast uh any other social media platforms that people should know about yeah, I mean, that's really it. I'd love people to come and check out the work that we're doing at Simmons University with uh, inclusiveleadership.com. Uh, I am writing uh, 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 in spring of 2022. So next spring, we uh, will be launching my next book, which I co-wrote with uh, uh, Dr. Lynn Perry Wooten, who's the current president of Simmons University and the chairman of the board of Deloitte, Janet Foudy. The three of us got together and wrote a book forwarded by former uh, CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Nui, and we interviewed a ton of executives, and the book is Arrive and Thrive, Seven Impactful Practices for Women Navigating Leadership. So I'm looking forward to talking more about what it means to arrive and thrive and all these seven practices. So be on the lookout for that. There's a little information already on our website. So excellent. Uh, I'm, in, I'm on LinkedIn. My maiden name is, you know, uh, there's a lot of Susan Brady's out there, so I, I kept, I'm keeping my maiden name, uh, McEntee, and uh, we'll, you can find me on LinkedIn. I love to stay in touch with folks and hear from people. So Great. Thank you. And for our audience, you'll be able to find information also out on the description of this uh, podcast. So, well, everybody, I want to thank you to, for your time today, Susan, and for joining us on this episode of BCN and Friends. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your great stories. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been great having you. We appreciate you being here. We've learned a lot already. Absolutely. And to all our listeners, we hope that you'll stay tuned as we continue on with BCN and Friends and bring you new and meaningful content and perspectives. If you have a suggestion for an episode, please email us at bcen at bcn.org. I am Mark Eggers, along with Michael Dexter. And on behalf of the entire BCN team, we thank and celebrate you for all that you are doing as professional nurses across the emergency spectrum. Until next time, 